Palantir stock versus Snowflake stock is the topic of today's presentation. And if you're somebody that's holding Palantir stock, you might find this topic to be a little bit more heated than Snowflake stockholders. So let's just address that elephant in the room. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who spend most of their time talking about a single stock. And coincidentally, it's usually a stock getting a lot of attention, the Palantirs or the SoFis or stocks like that. Uh, the, the end result is usually some sacred cow, which the zealots will always say, well, you just don't understand because they spend all their time talking about it. Um, Alex Karp of Palantir's comments, like uh, when asked about pricing, he says, well, um, we're not worried about that. We're just going to take it all. These are the types of comments that appeal to the ARK Invest types or people who hang on the words of management uh, instead of taking a more objective approach to analyzing stocks. And it's understandable because when you go all in on one stock, you better spend most of your waking hours convincing yourself you made the right decision. Now, when it comes to um, people who choose to take that investment approach, just remember that 95% of money managers who spend their lives analyzing the future prospects of stocks can't create alpha when measured against a broad benchmark over a sufficient period of time. So suggesting that investors deviate from best practices and start betting the farm on a particular stock is irresponsible at best. So the better approach that we take here at Nanalyze is that we've developed an objective methodology for analyzing similar stocks, and that's going to prove very useful throughout your investing journey. So what you'll hear the uh, typically Palantir zealots say is that um, comparing Palantir to any other stock is apples to oranges. Well, um, instead of trying to identify the differences, let's focus on commonalities and try to bring uh, these various groups of investors together. We all have the same goal of seeking alpha, so um, let's try to uh, find something we can agree on. We can agree that both these companies are roughly the same size. Both share a software and IT services industry definition. That's similar to a GIX classification. You can pull up Microsoft Excel for any set of stocks and look that up using their Refinitiv plugin. Uh, both of these companies are SaaS firms. They both sell software solutions to large companies that help their clients save money. Both are benefiting tremendously from the growth of big data and uh, AI as well. And um, just one of these companies seems to have a following of cheerleaders, as I said, who always say it's apples to oranges. So today let's focus on objective commonalities and not the differences. So Perhaps the best way to describe the interaction between Snowflake and Palantir is to take a look at what these companies do uh, in a separate topic. And we've done that. So here at Nanalyze, uh, we have over 2,300 written research pieces that we've produced. Our YouTube channel is a small part of what we do. We cover over 500 stocks. Here are a handful of articles about Snowflake and Palantir that would be some good uh, reading prior to watching this presentation. But I liked this slide here, which shows how a Foundry, Palantir's Foundry tool interacts with Snowflake. It's quite simple. This is taken right out of their documentation. It says, the first step to getting value from Foundry is to connect it to your organization's sources of data. Makes a lot of sense, right? And then they point to the tools that you can use to connect to various data sources. You see them listed on the left there. And look, there's Snowflake. And it says, select Snowflake from the available connector types. Very simple, right? So that's how these uh, two platforms interact. Uh, one uh, takes a more holistic look at an organization's data, and the other is more focused on managing an organization's data. So when we evaluate stocks of this type, we use what's called SaaS metrics, software as a service metrics, and uh, some key questions we want to answer. How much are existing customers spending? So if you uh, didn't take on a single new customer, the net retention rate is a measure that shows how much you would grow from your existing customers. Uh, are any of those customers canceling? Well, that's gross retention rate. You won't see a lot of SaaS firms provide that. Uh, how many paying customers do you have? Uh, that's an indication of breadth. And, and of course, what's minimum spend required to qualify someone as a customer? Uh, how concentrated are revenues by 
uh, customer or geography. And of course, revenue buckets help show existing customer spend. What matters less? Uh, profitability. So we're assuming that your 70 to 80% gross margins will lead to a profitable business. That's a given. Right now, we want to see uh, revenue growth, which is a proxy for market share captured. Uh, returning cash to shareholders, that's something that value companies do, not growth companies. So share buybacks or dividends are not something that uh, we actually uh, look negatively upon a company that does that because we'd rather they took that cash and reinvested it in growing their business. Short-term quarterly noise, earnings, rah-rah chance on social media. Uh, people that have a circle jerk over positive after-hours price action are just uh, focusing uh, uh, too granular and, and wasting their time. Uh, so is figuring out where the stock price goes next. That's why we have a uh, on-staff Romanian fortune teller. So whenever we want to figure out when stock prices or where they're going, we simply ask her. You just always focus on valuation when you're comparing companies. So let's talk about that. A simple valuation ratio here at Natalize, we use market cap divided by annualized revenues. We've done that for Snowflake and Palantir. And what a surprise. Both these companies are almost exactly valued according to this ratio. Now, What's interesting to note is that we have a stock catalog which contains over 460 tech stocks. And for about 200 of those, we calculate this same ratio. We take the average of that, and it's an internal indicator. And that's historically floated around 6.5. Well, we did our recent update, and it's now approaching 5, which shows us that the, uh, the valuation of disruptive tech stocks is coming down. And what we do is we say, well, we're not going to invest at three times the, our catalog average. So before that would have been around 19, and now that's more around 15. So uh, that would be Palantir at a share price of $15.60 or Snowflake at a share price of $123 if we use that cutoff. Now, just remember that historically Snowflake has been one of the richest stocks in our catalog while Palantir has uh, been recently enjoying lots of AI hype and of course, Snow has new earnings coming out, and when you have new earnings, that's a new um, quarterly revenue number that will adjust this ratio. But these charts here show that historical valuation, and as I said, you can see Palantir's valuation going up as the AI hype dominates the conversation, and Snowflake's slowly settling to more represent what's happening in the broader market. Now, when we look at revenue growth, we see that uh, at a compound rate over uh, the quarters that seen here, you could see that Palantir is growing at around 6%. Snow is growing at around 13%. So snow is definitely uh, enjoying faster growth, and it's um, past uh, Palantir. But what also matters would be profitability, and the best indicator of that for growth companies is gross margin because that shows the potential for profitability. We don't expect them to be profitable right now. We expect them to be focused on growing the business as fast as possible to capture blue ocean total addressable market. Uh, gross margins for Palantir across the top. There you see very healthy, 80% and upwards. And then this chart here taken from Snowflake uh, showing a more uh, longer look at the growth of their gross margin and the trend of that, which is very important to watch. Now, I wanted to take a second here and, and ask you to do me a favor. We don't run ads here at Nanalyze, so uh, we need your help to support this channel. If you want to become a better investor, then you're going to want to subscribe to Nanalyze because that's what we do here. We help people become better investors so they can grow wealth. That's all that we're interested in doing. So if you click sub subscribe, You'll not only become a better investor, but you'll help support our channel. So thank you for that. Net dollar retention rate, as I talked about earlier, this shows the amount of money that your existing customers are spending over time. If it's 100%, that means they're spending the same amount of money. If it's less than 100%, that means they're spending less with you over time. That's not good. And as you can see here, Palantir's net retention rate over time at which we dug into their documents to plot this. They don't have it readily available. You can see that decreasing. And uh, for Snowflake as well, though, that's less concerning. The concern here for Palantir is that they're starting to approach 100%. The average should be at around 120%. So um, 
another big concern here is that if you look at Q3 2022, this was the last time they put their net dollar retention rate in uh, nice big lettering. And look where it is today. This was taken from their latest earnings call. I can't even read that, so we had to uh, pull it out there. Net dollar retention was 107% this last quarter, impacted primarily by the headwinds from our commercial business in continental Europe. They go on to say that this doesn't reflect new customers. Of course it doesn't. We know what the meaning of net dollar retention rate is. What we're concerned about here is when you decide to bury this metric because it's no longer looking good. Go back to 2021 and see here. They broke it down by commercial versus government and by uh, geographic segments as well. What you can see there, that was actually a blended 131%. Well, what do these buckets look like now? If commercial uh, international was the lowest at 103, is that turning negative to bring the entire number down? We don't know because they don't tell us. What they need to do is just own that shit. So you can see here snowflakes. Plot that over time and let investors see the metric. You can see there's declining as we showed in that previous chart. Now, when it comes to uh, leadership, a lot of investors you'll see out there will say things like that. I'm invested in, in, in this company because of so-and-so. You see the SoFi investors, Anthony Noto all the time. Well, did you work with him? How well do you know that individual aside from pulling up their LinkedIn profile? Coming to the table with a strong track record is a given. It's why these people make big bucks. And I pulled up a Frank Slootman, so he's the gentleman commanding the team there as the CEO. And you see here his profile – that doesn't matter so much because if you're a hiring manager and you have experience as a hiring manager, then maybe you're in a position to start vetting people's competency. But then, of course, that it matters at what level you were doing that. If you worked with Mr. Slootman for a decade uh, at uh, somewhere around the same level that he operates, then maybe you're entitled to have an opinion about his competency. But uh, saying that you invested in a company because you listened to uh, what some talking head says, a media trained person says uh, in a conference call, um, that isn't a, a, a good thing to hang your hat on when it comes to investment thesis. So we always assume that whoever's running the show is a genius. That's why they're in that position and we expect them to uh, run the company appropriately. Now, when it comes to looking at SaaS firms these days, you're very concerned with stickiness. So when we consider Snowflake and Palantir, of course, Palantir's net retention declining uh, more so, let's say, getting closer to the dangerous number of 100% than Snowflake, but both are declining. Um, being able to query your data is critically important for every firm. So both these solutions um, don't seem to be going, uh, they're, they're not going to be displaced very easily. Being able to build applications around your data or even sell your data in a marketplace is very useful. That's what Snowflake is offering with their ecosystem. And then predictive analytics using AI to create operational efficiencies. That's what Palantir does. Uh, that's their core competency. It seems quite sticky, but our customer is going to spend more over time for that. Uh, Snowflake is displacing the OGs of data warehousing. Uh, these solutions are inherently sticky, and uh, data usage over time will only expand. So Snowflake's business model looks at consumption, which is very attractive. It's why they enjoyed such high net retention rates over time, and they talk specifically about in one of their calls about how clients are toning back their data usage in an attempt to curb expenditures or saying, do we really need to store this archive data? Let's get rid of it and, and cleaning up their data so that they spend less. Though so, um, data, the explosion of big data only stands to increase as time goes on. Now, when it comes to these two stocks, uh, we often think of stocks like women. Uh, men like to spend a lot of time discussing them. Uh, there's always a better looking one that catches your eye. And, and we're all looking for something different. You know, the old uh, blondes versus brunettes. Well, it's okay to like both of these companies. It's okay to own both. Uh, but if you want to commit to a single stock, um, spend your time looking for red flags. Uh, it's okay to own more than one stock, but you need to take a red flag approach when it comes to analyzing stocks for your portfolio. It's a given that every stock comes to the table with a great growth story. So to conclude, 
Uh, it's very important to have objective metrics to track a company's progress. We've looked at just a few metrics for these companies that uh, are interesting. Uh, learning to analyze companies, not just a single one, and spending all your time doing that is going to help you become a better investor. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, no matter what the social media pundits are trying to cram down your throat. And just remember, it's okay to like blondes and brunettes. Uh, you don't need to choose one. So I'm going to put up another video here for you to watch. Before you watch that, please like this video and help spread our content. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this today.